Good morning, Turner Christian Church. How are we doing today? Good? We're in good spirits? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Would you stand with me for the call to worship? Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Church, it is good to be with you this morning as we gather to worship our God and Savior and rejoice in the coming of the King on this Palm Sunday. 
As you're coming in, hopefully you're able to get the materials that we have available for you for t participation in the service. First of all, that would mean a bulletin that will give you all the, uh, the events that are coming up and the sermon outline and your Connect card. We encourage you to fill out that checking card and drop it in one of the boxes in the back just to let us know you're here. Let us know if you, if you have any prayer requests or any information um, that you need from us. Next, there is uh, communion is an essential part of what we do when we gather every week as Christians. And so we have communion elements available for you in the foyer to bring in with you. And uh, we invite all believers in Christ to participate in that with us. So if you didn't grab those, you can still get them in the foyer. Finally, kids, we are super excited that you are here with us. And we have activity packets to put in your hands while you're worshiping with us. And we hope that you will enjoy those. Those are also in the foyer. Um, as a church, we believe that... Being a disciple of Jesus means connecting with God and his church, growing in faith and love, and serving our community and world. And everything that we do as a church is designed to move us all in those directions or in that direction. And so during the service, if at any point you feel that God is prompting you to take the next step in one of those areas, um, then I would encourage you to grab one of the cards that's in the seat back in front of you. There's a red one, a green one, and a blue one. Whichever one fits with the step that you are wanting to take. Uh, fill that out, drop it in one of the boxes in the back, or you can just hand it directly to me or Pastor Rachel. We would love to follow up with you on what it looks like to continue in your journey uh, as a disciple of Jesus. All right, so announcements for what's going on in the life of the church. Um, nothing really going on this week, so we'll jump to April. Uh, <laughs> So the Northwest Christian Network, the big white building next door, is having their women's spring retreat. That's going to be Friday and Saturday, uh, April 19th and 20th. And so from all that I have heard, I have never been invited, but everything that I've heard that is a great event and um, really great fellowship with women from around the Northwest and good speakers, prayer time. I've heard nothing but good things. And so I encourage you to check that out on the Northwest Christian Network website. And we'll also be providing more information as it gets closer. But put that on your calendars. There is actually a lot going on this week. The first thing that happens this week as part of our celebration of Holy Week is our Maundy Thursday service. Maundy Thursday is the night of the Last Supper. And what we do each year is we have a service that focuses on beginning the journey toward Easter with that moment that Jesus spends with his disciples when he teaches them to, uh, when he gives them communion and he teaches them what it means to follow him. Each year it's a little bit different. This year it's going to be focused on, the, on finding uh, intimacy with Jesus and the, the ways that the, the obstacles that we face. The disciples did a really bad job of being close to Jesus on that night. And we want to learn from those bad examples and be able to spend time in prayer with Jesus. So that'll be the focus of the Monday Thursday service. Then, and that's at 7. Then on Good Friday, we have our Good Friday service, which focuses on working through the moments of the crucifixion and the beats of that story. And if you haven't been to that service, we you have a cross that we use to tell the story of Jesus. And we experience each of the beats of the story. And it ends with burying the cross in the tomb here in the baptistry. And then we leave at the end of the service. And I found that service to be really meaningful. And then it also connects with the, uh, it's what makes it worth it to get up and be here at 6.30 in the morning on Easter morning because we have a sunrise service where we begin outside the sanctuary and we come in to find out whether anything has happened in the tomb. And we get to celebrate the discovery of the resurrection. Then we go home and change into whatever we're going to wear for the church service and we come back for a potluck breakfast at 9 a.m. And that is, uh, as far as what you can bring, uh, you can bring casseroles, breads, or pastries, or fruit. There are no name assignments, so you don't have to know your last, how to spell your last name in order to bring something. Just bring something in one of those categories. We'd love to have you, or just come. We really want your fellowship. And then finally, our Easter worship service will happen at the regular time at 1030 when we will have our special celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. In the midst of that, we also have our Easter egg hunt, which will be happening on Saturday, and that is one of our biggest community events that we do throughout the year. We have tons of kids in the community come in here, and they get to hear about Jesus, and then they get to go out and scamper around our grounds looking for eggs full of candy. And it's just a fantastic time for fellowship and to get to know people and to connect with people. And so there, we are still in need of candy, and we can always use more church members involved. So there's an insert in your bulletin. If, you have, if there's a way for you to get involved, um, please fill that out, drop it in the box, um, and let us know. Now, on the back side of that, 
that insert, you'll also find the sign up for our spring classes. Our new Sunday school classes will be starting the Sunday after Easter, and we're going to have three classes. We're going to have a Christian's Guide to the Church, and we're going to study Ephesians, and then we're going to have our New Testament for Everyone Bible Study. That's Carol George's Bible Study, and they're going to continue on uh, in studying the New Testament. And then Frank Lloyd is going to be teaching a guide to Celtic prayer. So uh, those are the classes that we have offered, and it's helpful to us to know know how many to expect in each class so we can assign them the right size classroom. So if, you, if you're going to be coming, please fill that out and let us know so that we can pick the right classrooms. Those are the announcements that I have, which means it is time for us to stand once again to continue worshiping, <laughs> to continue worshiping God in song. So please rise. <laughs> there's, there's enthusiasm in the room and I love it.
to worship with you. It is also good to confess with you. Uh, confession is an important part of our identity as a church. It helps ground us in Christ and remind us of who we are and why we are here. And so there will be a time during this period of confession when you can bring to God the parts of you that are broken for which you need forgiveness, and also hopefully the parts of you that are being healed that you can rejoice in and, and thank God for. But we begin by confessing our faith in Jesus Christ, which is what draws us together and gives us hope. So please join me in our confession of faith. We confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is our Lord and Savior. As our Lord, with the right to command our lives, Jesus has given us these commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. In face of these commands, let us confess our sin. Dear Father, we have sinned. We have not loved you with our whole hearts or our neighbors as ourselves. Please forgive us and change us to be more like you. Thank you for the ways you have already changed us. Please repeat with me the promise of Scripture. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. 
Turner Christian Church, do you believe the promises of Scripture? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ has the will and the power to make you new? Yes. It's because of this assurance from Scripture and because of the work of Jesus Christ that we can assure each other Jesus Christ forgives your sins. Please take a moment to offer this assurance to those sitting around you. Because we are all reconciled to one father, we are reconciled as a family of brothers and sisters. And so as we come to the Lord in prayer now, we do so as a family and offering the prayers of this church family is Pastor Rachel. It is so good to get to pray with you this morning. Would you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear Father, we thank you for the sweet joy of gathering together. We know that we need it to be with your people in your presence. Lord, we praise you for the musicians we have on our worship team, and we thank you so much for the way they, ways they use their gifts and talents to bless others. We ask that you would provide more instrumentalists to increase their ranks and create more avenues for us to express our worship of you. We praise you for those that serve on the mission field, both here and abroad. We pray for those that have been called away from their comfort zones to serve you. We ask that you would strengthen them for the work and for the journey. May you encourage them in their labors and remind them of their worth and value. May they know your love of them extends beyond just their labors, but that you hold all of them within your loving care. May they know of your delight in them. We pray over ourselves. Lord, so often we mentally know ourselves to have received forgiveness but we seem unable to accept it. We pray that we would accept your forgiveness for our errors, our missteps and mistakes. May we know with every fiber of our being that your grace is bigger and stronger than our sin. Help us to live in the light of your forgiveness, forgiving ourselves as you have forgiven us. And we pray for the rulers of the nations of the world. God, help them to be people of peace. In all these things and more, we praise you that you are king. In your son's name, amen. All right, kids, it's time for junior worship. Everybody else can turn to their neighbor and say hello. Would you stand for our communion song? Please stand for our communion song. <laughs>
Good morning, church. Recently, Matthew and I were talking with some friends about remembering anniversaries. And depending on how many you want to celebrate, remembering them all can be tricky. Matthew made the comment that he felt anniversaries or birthdays that landed on or near a holiday would be easier to remember if we just attached them to that holiday. Virginia knows what I'm talking about. For also, our dog Pippin was born on Memorial Day. I don't know the exact day, but every year we celebrate his birthday on Memorial Day. Our daughter Charlotte was born the day before Thanksgiving, and if I'm honest, it would be a lot easier for me to remember the day before Thanksgiving than to remember November 24th. Palm Sunday is an anniversary for me in this way. I don't remember the exact date that I got baptized, but it was on a Palm Sunday. So every Palm Sunday, I celebrate my baptismal birthday. The pastor who baptized me is named Scotty Clout, and he still pastors at Zootown Church in Missoula, Montana. His was the first church I attended regularly that took weekly communion, and I loved it. Zootown Church had started out as a coffee shop in downtown Missoula, and they developed a rapport with the many bars, art galleries, distilleries, bookstores, climbing clubs, boutiques, and other coffee shops in that area of town. Every Sunday morning and every Thursday night, we carried 200 metal folding chairs upstairs, three flights of stairs from the basement, and crammed them into that tiny coffee shop for a church service. And every single Sunday morning and every single Thursday night, they offered communion and shared bread and juice with business owners, drug addicts, young parents, lawyers, teachers, Native Americans, college students, hippies, skiers, ex-cons, and cowboys. Anyone who was interested in learning more about Jesus or being a part of his kingdom was welcome at the table. A couple of years ago, a wonderful song came out by a band called Sidewalk Prophets. It was called Come to the Table, and the lead singer calls the gathering for communion a motley crew of misfits. And whenever I hear that song, I always think of taking communion at Zootown. I love that church family, and they still hold a special place in my heart, mostly because that's where I fell in love with weekly communion. And I am so very grateful that our church values communion the same way. It is such a beautiful glimpse of the feast that awaits us in heaven, where everyone who claims Jesus as their Lord and Savior gathers. No matter what kind of life they have come from, no matter how long they have known and followed Jesus, what a motley crew of misfits that will be. They might even let in you and me. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank and praise you that no one, anywhere, ever, is beyond the reach of your love. As we approach this table, may we show the love that you have given us with those who gather with us for this meal. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen.
Thank you, Elaine. Every year, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem brings to my mind a strange and slightly offensive incident that happened to a friend of mine in college. My friend and I were both part of a prestigious scholarship program named for Ronald Reagan. It was very competitive, and the school was a small liberal arts college. So from the first day of classes, everybody on campus knew who the Reagans were and what they looked like. And my friend was older than me. So one day, after a difficult conversation, I went to her for advice. How should I respond if a fellow student approaches me in the library and says that they should have gotten the scholarship instead of me? She told me an interesting story. The year that she received the scholarship, the first couple days of classes were especially rainy, and some of the sidewalks in front of the cafeteria had flooded. As she approached the cafeteria for lunch, a student in front of her, whom she did not know, stopped and blocked her way. Then they took off their very new, very expensive, and very white sweatshirt, laid it down in the mud on the sidewalk, looked her in the face and told her, we wouldn't want you to get your pretty little Reagan feet wet. That was not a good memory for her. I was horrified when I heard this story. Thank goodness nothing like that ever happened to me. But I never forgot it. And every time I read or hear the story of Jesus riding the donkey into Jerusalem, and I imagine the people laying their palm branches and their cloaks on the ground as he walked by, I think of my friend. For someone to lay something down for you to walk on is still a big deal in our culture. It was shocking for her. Now that person meant it as an insult, but it still carried meaning. It was still a weighty gesture. And I have to imagine that in first century Jerusalem, where there is no OxyClean, or stain remover. Letting a troop of people and a donkey walk on your clothes is a risk. Do you ever see those guys at a parade walking behind the, behind the horses with a shovel? Do you think they had those for Jesus' donkey? We don't know. I can't say for certain just how dirty that experience was, but I do have the frame of reference of a brand new white sweatshirt getting laid down in the mud. And if I knew that I had to wash it by hand, I can't think of very many clothes in my closet that I would be willing to let Jesus' donkey walk on. Even as I say that, I know it's not true. I would let Jesus' donkey walk on every stitch of clothing I own if I could just wear a paper bag and watch him go by. The point is, as we prepare to give and pray over our tithes and offerings, can you imagine with me what you're willing to put down and let go of for Jesus to walk on? We often think of our giving money to help the poor or evangelize or something tangible that helps other people in our world today. But can you imagine with me what you are willing to let go of just to honor him, just to show him that you love him? What are you willing to sh let go of to show him that he matters more to you than that thing? Does he matter more to you than a white sweatshirt? Does he matter more to you than a boat? Does he matter more to you than the thing at the top of your Amazon wish list? I'm not asking you not to buy those things. I'm not telling you they're bad. I'm asking about your heart attitude toward them. If Jesus came to town and the best way to honor him involved laying down on the ground something valuable and meaningful to you, would you lay it down and let him walk on it? Let's pray. Dearest Jesus, you praised the poor widow when she gave you everything she had. May we love you and honor you with our gifts, not out of our abundance, but out of our first fruits, out of the things that truly matter to us. Help us surrender our earthly desire to hold on tight to the things we love and use them the way we want to. Help us give all authority and oversight of everything we have to you so that they can be used for your plans and your purposes. We love you, Lord. Amen.
Good morning again. We are nearing the end of our current sermon series that we've been in since January, in which we have been looking at the kings of Israel and Judah. And today we are going to look at the end of the story of the kingdom of Judah. We're going to see the kingdom of Judah fall apart. And next week, we are going to talk about Jesus as king. But today, what we've been doing is we've been looking at these kings as examples to us of what it looks like to have authority delegated to us by God. Because even though we are not kings and queens in the traditional sense, we are people who have been given authority by God over the relationships that we have, the resources that we control, everything at our disposal God has given us and God has saved us in order to redeem our use of those things. And we are meant to then do, use everything we have been given in service of God. The stories of the kings help us to see that theme very clearly because that is the actual job description of a king. Your job description probably does not explicitly lay out your responsibility to God in your profession, but for them, it was in the job description. And so we can look at them to learn about the common human pitfalls and opportunities in that, in that task. So far, we've been focusing on the human kings, but today, we are going to be, as we look at Judah falling apart, we are going to be reminding ourselves of the great king over Israel and Judah, Yahweh. Yahweh, if you don't know, is the, the name, God's personal name that in the Bible is normally translated as Lord, but it's pronounced Yahweh as near as we can tell, because the Jews stopped saying it so long ago that we're not entirely certain. But what we're talking about today is the role of God as, as the king over all of these kings and as the king over us. And that we're talking about that because it really comes out in this particular passage. As the author of Chronicles tells us the story of how Judah fell apart and how Judah was destroyed, he makes choices to emphasize the fact that the ultimate king over Judah and over God's people is Yahweh. So first, I'm going to show you where we're at in the, in the line of kings, because it gets really garbled here. And then I'm going to read you the whole story, and then we'll go back over it. Last week, we looked at Josiah. Uh, Dr. Castens preached to us about Josiah, who was a king who, who launched a reform in Israel, or in Judah, that uh, was an inspiring reform, but ultimately, God told him it was too late that because of what his grandfather had done, the die was already cast. Now, Josiah's, campaign, Josiah's reform actually inspired a whole generation of prophets who uh, worked among the Jews to continue to call them to faithfulness. Uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and several, uh, Daniel were all inspired by Josiah. But from this point on, they were doomed. Josiah dies in battle with the Egyptians, and they immediately make his son Jehoahaz king. It takes the king of Egypt about three months to get to Jerusalem, and when he gets there, he takes Jehoahaz into custody, puts him in chains, and takes him into exile into Egypt. So Jehoahaz, it reigns for three months, still manages to get a reputation as being a very bad king. So I don't know what he did in those three months, but it was bad. And then the pharaoh puts his brother Jehoiakim on the throne. So this is the second son of Josiah. Now, Jehoiakim is one of the kings. The kings have been doing this uh, for a while now, but Jehoiakim it likes to play the two empires, uh, their neighbors, off of each other. Judah is stuck smack dab in the middle between Egypt and Babylon, and so they get caught up in the fighting, and they'll, they'll try and play one off against each other. So Jehoiakim starts out being a vassal of Egypt because Pharaoh put him on the throne. Then when Babylon becomes more powerful, he switches to Babylon to try and get a better deal. Then he thinks that after about 10 years, he thinks maybe Babylon is going down and Egypt is going up. So he switches back. He betrays Babylon, except he was wrong. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was not very happy about it. So he comes to Babylon and he takes the city, puts Jehoiakim in chains and takes him in exile to Babylon. And he puts Jehoiakim's son on the throne named Jehoiachin. Apparently, those names are different enough in Hebrew that they could keep them straight, but I struggle with it. Now, Jehoiachin reigns for three months, also somehow manages to get a very bad reputation during that time. And then Nebuchadnezzar changes his mind and says, you know what, I don't want him on the throne either, and takes him into exile into Babylon and puts the last, the last guy in line, 
which is a third son of Josiah on the throne. He's named Zedekiah. That's where we're at in the story now. Like I said, garbled, don't expect you to remember all of that, but does that look like a stable country to you? That looked like a promising stage for the kingdom of Judah to be in. It's not. Okay? So we are going to be looking at the events that happened in the reign of Zedekiah. And I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to read you the whole story. And then we'll go back and look at what the, the author is calling, out, calling to our attention in the way he tells this story. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before the prophet Jeremiah at the Lord's command. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear allegiance by God. He became obstinate and hardened his heart against returning to the Lord, the God of Israel. All the leaders of the priests and all the people multiplied their unfaithful deeds, imitating all the detestable practices of the nations, and they defiled the Lord's temple that he had consecrated in Jerusalem. But the Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word against them by the hand of his messengers, sending them time and time again, for he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept ridiculing God's messengers, despising his words, and scoffing at his prophets, until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. So he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, is another name for the Babylonians, who killed their fit young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary. He had no pity on young men or young women, elderly or aged, he handed them all over. He took everything to, Bath- to Beth. He took everything to Babylon, all the articles of God's temple, large and small, the treasures of the Lord's temple, and the treasures of the king and his officials. Then the Chaldeans burned God's temple. They tore down Jerusalem's wall, burned all its places, and destroyed all its palaces, and destroyed all its valuable articles. He deported those who escaped from the sword to Babylon, and they became servants to him and his sons until the rise of the Persian kingdom. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, and the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the days of the desolation until 70 years were fulfilled. It's 2 Chronicles 36. So this is a, um, this is a hard moment in the story of Israel, and it's a moment that calls out one of the things that we struggle with when it comes to understanding who God is, and that is God's judgment. Here we see something very violent happen to the people of Judah, and when it talks about the violence that is done as they destroy Jerusalem in Hebrew and in English translation, it's the, it, you're never quite sure whether the pronouns of the, of the one commanding the violence is King Nebuchadnezzar or God. It could actually be either way, that he could be God or that he could be Nebuchadnezzar. So there's this sense that God is bringing in a very destructive, uh, violent, brutal punishment is, is what's happening here. And that's something that we really struggle with, especially if you read the book of Lamentations. It's five chapters of lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and so what I want to do in this moment, as we look at this moment in history, is make sure that we really understand how God is, why God is acting this way. Because it is very clear in the text uh, based on the way it was written, that, that this author is emphasizing God's actions as the actions of an, over, of a king, of an, an overlord king to kings that, that owe him allegiance. So there's a couple things that we notice in this story. Number one, the dynamic that we find among the Jews is that Jew, Zedekiah refused to obey God as his overlord. This is what's being emphasized, that this is not a king who is just not following along with a religion. This is not a king who has some bad judgment or some bad morals or is making unwise decisions. This is a king who is refusing to obey God as his overlord. The kingdom of Judah and Israel, they were unique in the sense that their kings were appointed directly by God. Their authority was delegated directly by God. That is a unique relationship. And so... In this moment when Zedekiah is leading the kingdom down the wrong path, he's not just making bad decisions, but he's making rebellious decisions against the king who put him on the throne. First, the first way we see that is the way this is phrased. It says, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before the prophet Jeremiah at the Lord's command. So the author emphasizes the fact that there was prophets, especially Jeremiah, 
telling Zedekiah that he was going the wrong way, and he ignored them. Later on, when it says the Lord, their God, uh, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, has sent word against them by the hand of his messengers. He uses that word messenger, sending them time and again, for he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. So God sends messengers. That word is, this is the only place where that word is used for prophets. It's not the normal word for prophets. It's the normal word for a royal messenger sent by a king to someone who, to one of his underlings. That is a, a, that is a, a royal um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, herald, right? This is the person who goes and hands off the instructions to the lower management, right? So the, these prophets are not just eclectic, like religious weirdos that come out of the hills to yell stuff on street corners. They were actually brought into the throne room to speak to the king and give the king his orders from his boss. That is the way it was meant to be received. It says they kept God's messengers, God's ambassadors, another way you could say it, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. So the first big warning sign as we watch King Zedekiah's decline is that he ignored God's official ambassadors, the prophets. These were not advisors. These were not, when, when he gets a message that starts with, thus says the Lord, he's not supposed to take it under advisement. He's not supposed to add it to his portfolio of advice. And, and right, like that's, that is a command from God. And the commands from God had to do with a lot of things, that he, decisions that he would have wanted to make himself. A lot of decisions that we would consider to be maybe not religious decisions. I think that category of religion, restricting things to religion, is one of the, weird, one of the most harmful concepts that we have because it, it forces us to keep God in a box that he never was in in the first place. For instance, the prophets would come and tell Zedekiah, like, do not break that treaty. Do not break that treaty. You are supposed to be answering to that guy right now. God has put you under that guy right now, and you need to stay there. Those are decisions that I'm sure Zedekiah wanted to make personally based, and he did end up making personally based on his own political instincts. Like, hey, I think I can get out from Babylon if I bring in Egypt and if I tell Pharaoh that I'll do these things for him. And that, like, he wanted to play the two sides off against each other, just like the previous kings had. And, but Yahweh meddled in his business. And it's interesting then the other aspect of Zedekiah's rebellion, it says Zedekiah also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear allegiance to God, by God. He became obstinate and hardened his heart against returning to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan king. Nebuchadnezzar has a ton of problems himself, as we see in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's not a good guy. Brutal, violent, does horrible things, ends up committing so much violence that that is the reason why God has them conquered by the Persians. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar, not a good guy. And yet, God repeatedly tells Zedekiah and his, his predecessors not to rebel against them. That rebelling against the kings that God has put over them is rebelling against him. One of the main problems in the behavior of the kings, is that they keep trying to maneuver to get out from under the kings that they are under because their first, their first goal is always to, to pursue their own ambitions. I want to be the greatest king I can be. Turns out that the reason they're under these other kings is a punishment or is a, a measure by God to correct them. And so Zedekiah rebelled against the king that God put over him. This is something that we don't really like to hear as Americans because we really value unbridled ambition. We really like the idea that I'm going to climb as high as I want, and as long as I'm generally a nice guy while I do it, as nice as I can be and still get there, that's, that's the job. We don't like to think that maybe God calls us on a path that doesn't lead us to the place we personally want to be. Right? We don't like to consider the fact that maybe there isn't a way for you to reach the pinnacle of your profession uh, and still be obedient to God, right? If the only way to get there is to cheat or lie or something, then maybe that's just not where God's leading you. We don't like to accept that. We would rather make the little, the little concessions, cut the corners, do the ungodly things to get there, and then figure out stuff with God when we get there, right? 
The fact is that God puts us where we are for a reason. Now, I am not saying that there's never a reason to push back against oppression. That's one of the things that Jesus is going to do. Jesus is going, and, and, and I'm not saying that we should never try to change our circumstances. But what I'm saying is that we should not assume that my ambition for what I want to be is what God wants me to be. Or that getting to where I want to be is worth departing from the path and the commands that God has given me. When we do that, then we're saying that God's not really king of us. He's, he's an advisor. He's someone that we listen to and we take under advisement. But that's not treating God as king. So it's interesting that rebelling against the circumstances in his life was one of the ways that Zedekiah rebelled against God. And it's important to lay that foundation to understand that Zedekiah and his predecessors had this habit of repeatedly rebelling against the authority of God as their king in order for us to understand what God is doing in this story. Because what's happening in this story is that Judah's rebellion forced God to intervene as the great king. When he sends them into exile, when he has Jerusalem destroyed, he is acting as a king of justice, a king responsible for justice and order and peace. And that's how this story portrays God. It says, remember, they kept ridiculing God's messengers, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. Here's a phrase that needs cultural translation. What that sounds like to us and the way we often portray God is that his wrath is stirred up, means he is just so angry, he is so angry and it builds up to the point where he just cannot look past anymore, he can't contain his wrath anymore, and he just has to hit somebody. And that's what's happening. Is, is, this is God overwhelmed by anger at the sins of Judah that apparently he didn't know were coming, and he's emotionally overcome, and he's venting his wrath on them. And this is where we get the idea of an angry God. That's not the story that's being told here. That's not what wrath means. Because remember, this is a time of kings. A king and a government are the same thing. And so they didn't have this idea of a, a state that just existed and it had people who took office and left and that kind of thing. Right? Like in America, we, you know, the military takes oaths to the Constitution, not to a person. Right? We separate the institution and the person. They didn't have them back then. So the actions of the government were the actions of the king. And so when they talked about a king intervening in the world, that was his wrath. If you were being punished for a crime, you were experiencing the wrath of the king. Right? The wrath is his punishment. So in modern, t modern in terms, that would mean like when you get pulled over and get a ticket for speeding, you are receiving the wrath of the state of Oregon. Right? That is Oregon, the state of Oregon, acting on you in order to respond to your misbehavior, right? When God acts in wrath, it's not talking about his emotional state. It's talking about his actions as king. It would make no sense to say that God became emotionally overwhelmed because God didn't just find out about what they did when they did it. He'd known the whole time. He told them this was going to happen back in Deuteronomy. So what's actually happening is that when they stirred up God's wrath, they stirred up God's royal duty to oppose evil. God, they are his people, but God is king. That means that he has a responsibility for order, for peace, for good, that sometimes, that often actually requires him to contain or punish his own people, right? Because he's not their mascot, he's king. And so when he acts... He's acting to be a just king with, uh, with unruly subjects. That's why God is acting. It's not because he's lost his emo control of his emotions. It's not because he's an angry God. In fact, in the ancient world, they thought the opposite of God. God had the opposite reputation. We've talked about this, right? That, that God, because it says he gave them more chances than any other king would. People who are experiencing this story would not have been surprised that God, that God brought this punishment or that God destroyed Jerusalem. They would have been surprised that it took so long. It took so long that people are going to be wondering whether God ever really would punish anyone. 
Remember, this is what made Jonah so mad, that he just knew God was going to keep forgiving people. So this is not a, the story here is not that God is really angry. The story here is actually that God gives as many chances as he can until he has to step in for the good of the world. Because we're going to see the punishment, what he's doing in the world. Actually, punishment, punishment isn't even really the right word. He's not punishing. He is acting to restore peace and order. Because what he does, first of all, is according to the promises of the covenant. If you go through what, Jesus, what God did in this story, and you go back and read the terms of the covenant, this is exactly what he said he would do if they broke the covenant. They signed up for this. this is, these are the terms for dissolving the covenant. right? But the other thing is if you look at exactly what he did, you can see the motivation behind it. Chronicles gives us a really cool perspective on this. It says, he deported those who escaped from the sword to Babylon, and they became servants of him and his sons until the rise of the Persian kingdom. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, and the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the days of the desolation until 70 years were fulfilled. Now, if you're my wife or you were at the, you were at the Thursday service, you can't answer this question. Why? Because I know she knows. Why 70 years? Do we know why God set the, the um, exile for 70 years? It has, to do, you know, it has to do with the Sabbath year. In the law of Moses, every seventh year, you're supposed to take the break. You're supposed to give the land a break. Nobody farms anything. Everybody rests for a year, and you just trust that God is going to make the land produce enough food for everybody. It requires a lot of trust in God as king and a lot of obedience, and they never once did it. Okay? For 490 years, they lived in the promised land without observing a single Sabbath year, without giving the land a break. How many Sabbath years did they miss in 490 years? 70. They missed 70 Sabbath years. And what the author here is saying is that God took them out of the land for 70 years so that the land could catch up and could get a rest from all of the horrible things the Israelites had been doing. It says they were worse than the people who preceded them. Like the last generation of Judeans were the worst people to ever occupy that land. And they were God's people. So the Sabbath, or the, the, the exile, is not God saying, man, 70 years will teach you. Like, you know, I'll just make you, send you there long enough for you really to learn your lesson until I'm not angry anymore. Like, maybe it takes God 70 years to cool off. That's not the point. The point is to emphasize that their sins had consequences for the land they were in, and he is sending them away to give the land a break. God is acting as a God who's not their mascot. Other kingdoms, their gods were just their mascots. They did whatever, they were on the side of the kingdom. No matter what, that was the goal, right? Yahweh is not a mascot. He is on the side of right. And he doesn't move when his people move. So exile was the only way for God to restore peace to the land. It's not how long it takes him to cool off. It's him, making, you know, it's him restoring balance, restoring peace after all of the evil and cruelty that happened in the kingdom. Now, Jeremiah said it was going to be 70 years. And after 70 years, some of them did come back. But before that happened, Daniel, an angel came to Daniel and said, really, in the most important way, it's not 70 years. It's more like 70 weeks of years. It's more like oh, about 500 years or so before the exile is really going to end. About 500 years later, there was a whole century where the Jews were just constantly at a fever pitch of expectation. God's going to act because the 500 years are up. And that's what led to this huge explosion of, of uh, attention, of rejoicing when a man shows up to Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Says he's the king of David. Says he's bringing the kingdom. These people know that they've been waiting for God to restore the kingdom. And it says, after they brought the colt to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the colt, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now he came to the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Why did these people get so excited about a, a preacher that most of them had never met and probably only heard rumors about? Because from the very beginning, when God sent them into exile, and even from before that, he had promised that he would restore them. Because God's punishment was not, I'm done with you. It's not, I'm, I'm, that's it. I'm fed up with you. That's, you know, we're done. That's not what God ever said. That's not the, the actions that he took. Instead, in the fullness of time, God sent a new king to restore his people, which was always the plan. There was never a plan for God to abandon his people. There was always a plan for him to restore them. And to find, not to restore them with another king who's a broken human being like the rest of us so that they could go back into all these cycles. Right? I think by now, after three months of sermons, we've learned that human beings just do not make good kings of God's kingdom. We just can't really be trusted with the top job. We can barely be tr trusted with the bottom jobs. And that's only because of the Holy Spirit. But there is a king that has been sent to us, Jesus Christ. And he came. It's important for us to connect that moment with the moment that we're looking at today. That the next king after Zedekiah is Jesus. Same family line, same mission. Jesus is the new king. And that's what got everybody excited in Jerusalem. Now, it also made them really angry when they realized on Friday, that Jesus' kingdom was different from what they hoped it would be. Because they actually wanted more of that broken stuff that might give them a chance to take it to the Romans. So they turned on him when he brought the kind of kingdom they didn't want. But he is the king. And that really brings us directly to this last part of the sermon when we, when we apply all of this to ourselves. What does it mean to be part of the kingdom of God serving the same king? Right? Because that's the thing, is that when they go out to preach the gospel, the very first time they preach the gospel, after the resurrection, this is what Peter says. God has raised this Jesus. We are witnesses of this. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. Anointed one means king in the line of David. He's saying, this is the new guy. This is the guy who has the crown that, that Zedekiah... That, that got taken from Zedekiah. This is the new king, and we know it because he's alive. And this is, every time they preach the gospel in the book of Acts, this is the center of it. Good news, Jesus, God has made Jesus king, and the resurrection proves it. Okay? Now, that's good news, right? So we call the gospel, it's good news, which is actually in the Old Testament a political phrase for a new king or a king winning a battle. But how did the first audience respond to the good news? Were they happy? Were they excited? It says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, brothers, what should we do? Now, why were they pierced to the heart? Because it's not good news if the guy who's king is the guy you just crucified. Right? That is not the guy they want to be king. They really put all their eggs in the Jesus isn't going to be king basket when they had him executed, Right? So to find out the guy that they just brutally killed in the most horrible way they could come up with is now king, not an exciting thing to find out. Because the truth is that Jesus as king is only good news if you submit to him. It's not good news for the other guy to be king, for the other side to be king, right? It's good news to find out that your guy is on the throne. But the good news is not just that Jesus is king. The good news is that Jesus is king, and he offers a free pardon to anyone who will take it. That's the good news. Because when they say, what should we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. He's saying, pardons for everybody, anybody. Take the pardon, and you're in the kingdom. Jesus bears no grudges. He's saying this to the very crowd who yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Same people. And he's saying, you know what? Jesus just wants you to submit to him. Just switch sides. Because that's what baptism is. Baptism is submission to Jesus as your Lord. It is a way of saying, I am, I am going into his kingdom. I am a subject of this king. He has my loyalty. That's what baptism means. And so he's saying, 
submit to Jesus, follow him, and you're in. You're in the kingdom. So it's a good news because the invitation is open. But that's different from saying that there's no consequences. That's different from saying that it doesn't matter whether you accept Jesus as Lord. And this is where things, again, get, get touchy because sometimes we talk about Jesus as if he's kind of two-faced. Like, like he's really nice if you're in, but you don't come in, that he's really mean and angry and he does horrible things to you. That's kind of a, an, an attitude that we get. And that's not what the Bible portrays for us. So there's another important moment that happens on Palm Sunday as Jesus is journeying to Jerusalem. And it, again, connects today's story with the story of the triumphal entry. Um, Sorry, did I give you this one? Yeah, okay. As he approached and saw the city, Jesus wept for it, saying, If you knew this day, what would bring peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Does that sound familiar? About 40 years after Jesus said that, the Romans came in and leveled the city just like the Babylonians and destroyed the temple. Because the Jews, again, caught up in that messianic fervor, that, that, that excitement about the signs of the times, but only wanting a certain kind of kingdom, they went and rebelled against the Romans and they fought against each other and it was a mess and they got destroyed. And then they tried it again in all the other places that they lived a couple decades later and got destroyed again. And then they did it a third time, and that's finally when they just completely destroyed Jerusalem, turned it into a Roman city, built an altar to, uh, to Jupiter on the Capitol Hill, and just barred Jews from ever entering the city. Jesus foresees all of this, and what he says is that those real-world things happened because they rejected the path that Jesus offered them. Right? He weeps for them because if they had recognized him and if they had followed him, it would have led them down a different path with different world consequences. And this is what's important for us to remember. We've talked about this a few times through this series that God, most of the time, God doesn't really have to add anything, any extra consequences to our sins. Our sins generate their own punishments most of the time. Usually what God has to do is just let you keep on your policy because sinful policy leads to bad places. It's a big reason why it's called sin. It's why God tells us not to take those paths. So the urgency of joining God's kingdom first and foremost comes from the fact that obedience to Jesus brings peace and rebellion leads to destruction. Before we even talk about eternal fates or judgments, which there is judgment that happens and there are eternal fates, but before we even get there, we can simply talk about the fact that life led apart from Jesus goes to bad places. Jesus doesn't tell you to live a certain kind of life because he likes controlling people, because he likes meddling in places where he has no business. Jesus gives us commands, first of all, because he's our king, and when we confess him as our Lord, we're telling him that every part of us is his business. But second of all, because he loves us and he has a plan for us and he wants us to lead the kind of life he made us for, which is always better than the life we choose for ourselves. Always. And so as a culture that values independence, as a culture that values self-sufficiency, it's hard for us to hear the message that we are supposed to submit to someone as king. But which king would you rather submit to? Name me a person you would more trust as your king. I don't know about you, but I trust Jesus more than I trust myself. So myself as king of my own life does not work out either. So what we have to respond to as, as people being invited into the gospel or being invited to continue in the gospel, we are responding to Jesus being our Lord, right? We say it every week and the words are, can be meaningless, right? People will talk, you know, you'll hear the quote on TV, if you, you know, if you're taking Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's like the, the, just the typical thing that evangelists on the street say, right? We don't think about what that means, but what it means is to take Jesus as our king. It's a hard path to walk, so hard that we can only walk it by the help of the Holy Spirit and as a congregation together. But it is the right path to walk. It is the best path to walk. And we are invited to this path for our good and for the good of the world around us. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up, and I'm going to ask you, 
Who is your king? Whose will do you follow? If you have not given your life to Jesus, if you have not made him your king, today is the best day to do it because it changes your life. It changes who you are. It changes where you're going in this life. It changes your relationships. It changes everything about you. Today is the day to submit to Jesus. Now, maybe you've already submitted to Jesus, but the thing is that God still wants people. He doesn't want to make you a slave. He wants to make you a delegated son or daughter. And so he gives us the choice to continue on that path with him, right? We have the ability to resist what God is doing in our lives. So maybe you need to recommit to the reign of Jesus in your life. Maybe you need to recognize some patterns in your life where you have taken your life back from God and you need to return rule to its rightful place. Today is the best day for you to make that commitment. Maybe you need help. That makes you just like the rest of us. You need the help of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus Christ offers us as we submit to him, and you need the help of a congregation. That's who we are. We are a support group for people who struggle with authority, with divine authority, right? Not because we have it figured out, because we, are, we want to do the struggle. We want to be God's kingdom together. And so we would love for you to take further steps in discipleship with us, whether that means getting baptized. We are actually going to have a baptism this next Sunday on Easter. So the tank will already have water in it. Easter's a great day to get baptized. If you need to submit your life to Jesus, let us know. You can contact me throughout the week, or you can raise your hand during the service next week. You don't need to give us any notice, but we want to get you in the water. Maybe, it mean, maybe your step is getting more connected with a small group where you can share your burdens with others, or maybe it's getting into a class where you can learn more about what it looks like to follow Jesus. Um, I encourage you to grab one of those cards in front of you, the one that fits with the step that God is laying on your heart. I want you to fill that out and hand it to me or put it in the box. But don't let today pass. Don't let this moment pass without committing to the step that your king is putting on your heart to take and following him. Amen? With that, I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing our final song together. everywhere for someone, something, some power, something to guide us in the way we should go. Father, we turn to such destructive things in our need for direction. We are so thankful to know that you have made Jesus our king and that his offer of pardon is free for all. We thank you for the pardon we have received. We thank you for the kingdom into which you have welcomed us. We pray that you would make us into faithful citizens of that kingdom. 
We pray that you would show us how to live each day so that people will see that we have a loyalty that is different, that stands out, that we follow Jesus. We pray that in that testimony that they see that they would see something that they know they need. We pray that through our loyalty to you, we would set an example that shows others that you are the one that we should follow, the one that we must follow, that true peace and fulfillment and truth comes only through submitting to you. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord and our King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't forget that the next service we'll have for Holy Week will be Maundy Thursday at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. And then we'll move into Good Friday the next night. And then we'll move into Holy Week or the Holy Weekend. So keep track of those. Secondly, if you are able, in order to make enough room for Easter, we're going to move all of the special furniture out of the sanctuary and into a classroom. So if you're able to help us with that after the service, please hang around and help us move the beanbags and the couches and things like that. Um, other than that, um, I look forward to seeing you as we continue to celebrate Holy Week together. Please join me in our benediction. To Jesus Christ, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Stay healthy, stay hopeful, and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.